Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Our colloquium speaker today is Paula Scotti. All right, settle down. We got science to talk about. So our colloquium speaker today is Paula Scotti from University of Washington. Paula has been there for more than 40 Forever. years. 50. Yeah, for more than 50 years. Uh, she was briefly a researcher at Caltech in the 70s. Um, and in that time, she has a long history of leadership. So she's been editor for PASP, for APJ. Uh, she's also been president of AAVSO, president of AAS. She just finished her stint there. Um, and she's done amazing research in that time. So she's an expert on cataclysmic variables, accreting white dwarfs. So I'm sure she'll tell us the difference between nova systems and nova-like systems. and positive super humps and negative super humps and she's doing all kinds of interesting work with new data uh, which I heard a lot about at, at KFTP workshop that we were at together last month. She had a lot of fun stumping all the theorists with all these new observations so I think we'll hear more about that today. Take it away Paula. Thanks Jim. Yeah, it's really fun to be back here because I was here in the late 70s and working with graduate students, Franz Cardova, who went on to become head of NSF, uh, Graham Berriman, who's still around here somewhere, Anila, I think you were a graduate student in those days too. <laughs> so it's really nice to be back and now working with uh, students like Tony and postdocs like Jan. Um, so uh, I've done this. As Jim said, for more than 50 years, been working on cataclysmic variables, and I've stuck with them, whereas a lot of people have left and gone into exoplanets or dark energy. Because really, cataclysmic variables have a lot of interesting things, and they're constantly doing something different, so it's never boring. There's always something new. Um, and I'm hoping to share some of that with you um, today. So a cataclysmic variable, let me just start out um, defining it, because different people have include different things into cataclysmic variables. Um, so in my definition, uh, it has to be a close binary system. So uh, we're talking about periods on the order of hours, generally. The longest is two days, but that's really an exception. Uh, even the ones at eight or nine hours, they're harder to work on. The great thing about CVs is in, in a couple of hours, in one night, you can get a couple of orbits. So you can really follow what's happening throughout the orbital cycle of a system, and they're easy to observe, and I'm an observer. Um, it has to have a white dwarf primary. The primaries in these systems, for the masses that have been accurately measured, they're all near 8 tenths solar mass, whereas single white dwarfs are near 6 tenths, so they're generally more massive. Uh, and that's been one of the puzzles as to why they're all massive. I, you know, some of the ideas are you can get rid of the lower mass ones, or you have some evolution that creates the, the larger mass. It has a low mass secondary, and those secondary stars can be um, there's a few that are like K stars. Um, the, the binary, the, the larger the binary, the larger the secondary you can accommodate. So you can have like a G or K star, but those are the rare exceptions. Generally, they're basically all M stars, and they can extend down into the L T, T dwarfs and brown dwarfs uh, as well for companions. They have to actively be transferring mass, and the mass transfer rates are something like 10 to minus 8 to 10 to minus 11 solar masses per year. Um, so some people include things like um, symbiotics in here, or AM can vans. Um, so in principle, you could, because they follow some of these characteristics, but in general, I, I don't, uh, I'm not going to be talking about those kinds of systems today. Okay, so there's also, besides you know, what you include, there's many different categories or names that are assigned to different kinds of, of cataclysmic variables. I like to do the classification based on the magnetic field of the white dwarf. So in, the, in general, um, it's not terribly easy to measure a magnetic field. You have to be able to, first of all, see the white dwarf, and you have to be able to um, measure fields that are more than a, a kilogauss. So we're talking about um, tens of kilogauss to megagauss fields we can actually measure with Zeeman or cyclotron uh, humps. But we think basically due to evolution, all white dwarfs have some magnetic field. Um, and so they're probably all kilogauss fields. So the j vast majority, and we now know somewhere between 4,000 to 8,000 are some of the numbers. So a lot of the, the CVs that are known 
are candidates, or so we're not totally confirmed, but there's thousands of them. And the expectation is that there's probably a few million in our galaxy, so they're very numerous. Um, the disk in these systems um, extends, so the mass transfer comes over from the secondary, uh, circulates in an accretion disk, and that disk can extend right down to the white dwarf surface, or probably close to it. We think that from accretion disk work that there's probably a, a little zone around uh, where the, the boundary layer is, where there's actually doesn't disk actually meet the white dwarf. Uh, if the field is a little bit higher, and we're talking about one to ten megagauss here, uh, past the kilogauss regime, the alpha N radius clears out the inner disk, and so when the mass transfer comes over from the secondary star, it, it comes into this ring and then accretes in these accretion curtains. And in this case, you can actually, uh, the white dwarf is spinning faster. It's not locked to the orbit like it is in the next system I'll talk about. So you can actually detect the spin of the white dwarf as the accretion comes and it creates x-rays. So you can see the, the spin very clearly in the x-rays, and that's called an intermediate polar. And there's about 100 or so known. There's probably many more out there that haven't been discovered yet. Uh, if the field goes up to 10 to 250 megagauss, then the magnetic field basically controls the flow, and it comes straight from the secondary over to the, the probably two accretion poles. Uh, they're usually dipoles or quadrupoles, so it can split in and, and comes down to, to the pole itself on a, in a very concentrated spot. Um, and then lastly, there's this category that we call LARPs, or low accretion rate polars, where the accretion rate is very low. We're talking about 10 to the minus 13 or so. Uh, is probably a wind. There's no stream. The wind from the secondary gets taken by the magnetic field of the white dwarf um, and creates features that show that it's magnetic. So I'll be, I'll be talking about these different types. So just to show what's happening in the different accretion regimes, and accretion is the underlying thing, why CVs are so interesting. It's, there's always variations in the accretion. The effects of the accretion are what creates things in the light curve and the spectra that make them so interesting. So for the disk accretion, which is the vast majority of cases that we know, um, you have a, a low state, which is the normal state of the system. The disk is pretty thin and builds up uh, with matter as the stream feeds in. And you have basically a boundary layer that's optically thin in x-rays. And then when the disk builds up enough, it, the, the opacity increases, the viscosity increases, and we have what's called an outburst. Um, so you get a lot more matter dumping onto the uh, white dwarf at that time, and the accretion disk is very thick, optically thick, and the boundary layer becomes uh, basically a black body that's emitting in the EUV regime. For magnetic accretion, we have these streams coming over to these very concentrated small areas, uh, and it creates a shock, and so what comes out there is hard x-rays, um, cyclotron emission from that shock, and that's a characteristic of a magnetic uh, polar situation and also part of the accretion uh, columns, uh, curtains that are seen in the eyepiece. So accretion affects a lot of what's going on in these kinds of systems. It affects the whole evolution of a close binary. So the mass transfer changes the composition, uh, alters the structure of the white dwarf, speeds up evolution in many cases, just totally alters what's happening versus single star evolution. It, the accretion heats up the white dwarf from the accretion um, it makes a white dwarf spin faster than it would in a, just a field situation. And for those stars that are pulsating um, in the instability strip for the white, white dwarfs, it really affects the, it's a way where we can actually study the interior structure of a star um, and study the accretion of matter, what happens when matter is in the white, surface of the white dwarf is heated and how that affects the interior. And then the outburst activity, uh, besides just the dwarf nova outbursts, I'll be showing you some other kinds of what are called bursts in these systems. And part of the problem, the current things that we're studying now is, is what is actually ca causing this other kind of activity that is happening. So t I'm going to touch about these basically three areas. We, evolution, we can look at and study through the orbital periods of the systems. Um, and the, we, what we want to do is get the numbers of objects in each orbital period um, that traces the evolution of the close binary as it, it gets closer and closer together during its evolution. 
The white dwarf is also another way to study the evolution because the white dwarf is going to be cooling, but it's actually heated by the secretion as it goes through its evolution. And to study the white dwarf, we have to use the UV because the optical is swamped by the accretion disk light or the accretion funnel, um, the curtain, et cetera. So it's very difficult to study these things in the optical. We get, we get a picture of the disk or the funnel in the optical, but we don't get a picture of the white dwarf, so we really have to use the UV. And with the UV, we can get spectra and determine the temperature, the rotation, and the pulsations. And then the advantage of the latest data is all the survey data, especially the long cadence, um, long time scale, short cadence stuff that's available from Kepler and TESS, because uh, we've really learned a lot in the last few years from these surveys. So let me start with evolution. Um, so the past evolution, the, you have to have a binary that starts out, and it has to be close enough that at some point when the, red, the more massive star becomes a red giant, uh, it creates a common envelope. And that's what creates the really close nature of the, of the system. So in order to get a close binary, you have to start out with a certain set of parameters in the initial binary so that it will go through the common envelope and the two stars will get closer together. Um, so once they move together, they come out of the common envelope, it's dissipated. They're still not close enough for mass transfer. Their orbital periods are on the order of seven or eight hours uh, in the scheme of things. And you have to be able to move them closer together. And that happens through angular momentum losses, uh, through magnetic breaking, and through gravitational radiation. And so eventually, they'll get to the point where the uh, secondary fills its Roche lobe and can transfer mass. And then you basically have a cataclysmic variable. All right, so population models have been around for a long time. First ones, good ones, came out about early 2000. Um, and this is the scheme that, uh, that has been put out for this. So they start out, let me find my cursor here. Uh, this is the eight hour period. Uh, the, the color scheme here shows you how many are seen at each of these uh, orbital periods. And this is a function of mass accretion rate, which is a, basically a luminosity indicator. And so they start out at long periods, lose angular momentum, come down here. Uh, the angular momentum loss at the longer periods is thought to be magnetic breaking from the wind of the secondary, being forced to rotate with the orbital uh, motion. Uh, there seems to be a gap, and that gap is thought maybe to be due to the convective activity, uh, con the secondary star becoming totally convective around an M4 and uh, turning off the magnetic breaking, although this is, you know, a little bit iffy. Uh, but anyhow, we know that below uh, about uh, three hours, two to three, two to three hours is sort of a dearth of system, so something is turning off. And then the, the, it starts again with a slower rate, and that's gravitational radiation is the loss here. Um, lost my cursor again. Gravitational radiation takes over here. And then as the systems, uh, the secondary becomes degenerate, the period will actually, the response to the uh, mass transfer is that the, um, the period will increase. And we call these things down here at the end, just use this, down here, the period bouncers, because they pass what we call the period minimum, and the period starts increasing again. And so we can find, we can check if this procedure is right by looking at the orbital periods of systems um, from various surveys that have been done. And originally, the brightest systems, these are the ones that have the highest mass accretion rates with the earliest spectral types of the secondaries, are down at that eight hour end. And the PG and Hamburg surveys found all those. Um, and then as SDSS came into play, we found all the ones that were fainter down here at the shorter periods. And ZTF and the future of LSST will find also the faint ones as well. So we have a checks and balances on this. And what we're finding out is that really, from the, num from the colors here, you can see most of these objects in the age of the universe should be at the period bounce stage. And we're not finding those. So we knew right away that something was not right. And the something, part of it, is the selection effects. So Galasha Nelson, about 15 years later, did a better job putting out like what are, including all the selection effects. It's easier to see the brighter ones, but it's also fairly easy now to find the short period ones. So the selection effects are here on the bottom. 
But the intrinsic population is still the same. We should be seeing 90%, 80 to 90% of all the systems should be at the period bounce or right at the turnover, and we don't see that many. There's like 12 period bouncers, no. Um, so there's something wrong um, with, the, with the model that we have for evolution. And we could see some of the selection effects um, prior to Sloan, when we were only seeing basically the brightest systems, um, that was the light dashed lines there. Um, most of the distribution was on the longer orbital period. But then Sloan moved it over and said, yes, we are finding more. Most of the ones we're finding that are fainter are the short period ones. But we're still not at the numbers that are expected. And uh, Boris put together all the data from, that we had from Sloan uh, to make this kind of a plot. Nowadays, we have Gaia. And Gaia has been a tremendous help because now we have the distances, so we know, kind of know what's around us. And uh, there's been papers by Anna Pella on the, just the, all the systems that are within 150 parsecs of us, and we can sort out like how many magnetic systems there are, what the orbital periods are, et cetera. Um, this is some work that I've been doing with Ellie Abrahams, um, I was a graduate student, it was Josh Bloom at Berkeley, um, just came out with this paper um, that shows the distribution in terms of color and absolute magnitude, because now we have the the actual distances. And so you can see, again, the color is plotted by orbital period, so the short period guys are down here. And this is the white dwarf sequence in light gray from Gaia, and the other upper light gray sequence is the main sequence. You can see they all sit there. But if you look at the orbital periods, it's like crosshead, it's orthogonal to the, to the diagram here. So they constructed this model that can figure out what the orbital period is, given uh, this model of exponents based on the absolute magnitude and the Gaia color. So this means if we have a system that has Gaia magnitudes now and is discovered, without going through all the, the pain it takes to determine the orbital period, monitoring it at over several cycles, we can actually just estimate uh, what the or orbital period is um, by using the absolute magnitude and the colors. And this just shows if you plot this, on a three-dimensional diagram of absolute magnitude, orbital period, and color, you can see that the slope of the fits for the model as you go down um, from the longer periods, and again, the color coding is the green, is the yellow is the shortest, and the red and purple are the longer periods, it's much steeper, which is in line with what we expect from magnetic braking. That law, magnetic braking law is fairly steep, but then it, it levels off um, to the shorter periods, and that's gravitational radiation. That's sort of what expected. But it still does not, it's not showing the vast majority of systems being at the, the short period end. So one other approach to this is through um, looking at the white dwarf, because the white dwarf is also cooling down through its evolution. And so this has involved a lot of um, UV work over the years, starting with Ed Sion and Patrick Godin at Villanova, where we looked at um, several uh, CVs, white dwarfs, and got their temperatures, and we can look at the match with a model, the line, absorption lines that we see in the UV, um, and get a rotation for the white dwarf. Uh, lately, Boris and his students, who are now graduated, Odette and Anna, and off on their own, uh, at Warwick, are we have these big programs to get a lot of temperatures of white dwarfs, so we can actually use them. So we can get evolution. If we have the mass, temperature, and composition of the white dwarf, we can put them on these diagrams and, and, and match them with the models. And then we can also get some, some idea of the magnetic field effects and the accretion heating. Because remember, in the UV, the disk is not as important. Um, it's not as prominent. And so we actually can actually see the white dwarf. And if you're going to model the white dwarf, you have to actually see it. Um, as a dominant mechanism. And, and this is just a, a plot from a paper way back um, 10 years ago or so ago that we used um, in that time when the um, STIS was broken, so we had to use the SBC, so the resolution is not as good. But it, I like this plot because it shows um, the, the importance of the UV versus the optical. So the data is a little bit hard to see here. Let's see, was there a... Okay. So what's happening here, this is the optical regime. The dark is the data, and the light are the models. And sometimes it's hard to see the, 
the data overlaid on the models. But this is three different temperatures for white dwarfs. And you can see the drastic change in the temperature as you do the fits in the UV versus the optical, which is kind of all on top of each other. Okay? So that's why we need, we can, from this early data, we could get temperatures that are one or 2,000 degrees accurate because it's clearly, this is the right solution here. It's the middle one in each case versus the top ones, whereas in the optical, you can't really tell. So we needed to have the UD. As we went over to COAST um, data, we could do a better job. And we got a lot of data over the years with temperature and, and composition. So what, what's happening here is, so this is the, the data is in the black. And we can fit the white dwarf model. In the blue, we use basically human white dwarf models. The white dwarf is the absorption lines but you also see some emission lines coming from the accretion disk. So the accretion disk is contributing something, but it's, it's primarily the white dwarf. And the advantage of the UV, besides the fit to the white dwarf, is we can actually determine the estimate of the contribution of the accretion disk. Because for a white dwarf, the Lyman alpha should go down to zero, but it's not. It's about 10% of the flux. And so we take this as the contribution of the remaining stuff which is the accretion disk. So basically, it's telling us that 90% of the light in the system is from the white dwarf, and we can trust the fit, and only 10% is from the accretion disk, whereas the optical is dominant with the accretion disk and uh, not the white dwarf. So this is just some examples of the fits. We had a large HST program in cycle 20, um, and Anapala has put together from this, from the data in our cycle 20, along with all the past data that's been accumulated for all the 43 systems that have Gaia distances. So we actually have the distance. Um, the, there's ambiguities in the model when you're trying to fit the mass and the log G, but if you have the distance, you can constrain and actually get out the mass um, and, the, and then use the mass radius uh, relation of the white dwarfs to get out the mass radius and the temperature of the white dwarf. So just shows you some examples of the kinds of fits that we're getting from 11,000 in some systems to 26,000 in others. And they're very good fits. We could get the temperatures down to a few hundred degrees versus um, a few thousand degrees. And so Anna put them together on this diagram uh, of temperature on the top and its M dot accretion rate on the bottom. And you can get accretion rate because the lum accretion luminosity is a function of the accretion rate and mass and radius of the white dwarf. And since from Gaia and the fits, we have the mass and radius of the white dwarf and the luminosity, we can then solve for M dot. Okay, so we've got, we've got it all on this to do the evolutionary stuff. So the, the circles here are the data. And the lines are different models that have been fit to the data for different masses. So the different colors are the masses the models for different masses of the white dwarf. And you can see the classic model is the classic angular momentum loss from magnetic breaking, which is some power law, fairly steep power law, um, and then gravitational radiation below. And you can see it really, the classic model is not doing a very good fit at all, and the turnoff is wrong, and the, certainly at longer periods it doesn't work at all. And then, lately, there's been this um, empirical consequential angular momentum loss. So people have determined that the angular momentum is not right, and so this has to be flatter in the longer periods, and uh, it has to be a little bit steeper, so there has to be some other source at this low end, short period end to account for the distribution we're seeing other than gravitational radiation. And that other something is some angular momentum loss associated with the mass transfer. So this is, it's empirical, there's no real cause for putting this in, uh, but it works. It works a lot better, as you can see in those fits. The only th place it doesn't work well is in the turnover for the period bouncers. So the stars here are period bouncers, things that are past increasing in period. And the model is predicting this steep drop-off because this enhanced um, 
the empirical model has lower masses having a greater amount of this than upper to fit. And so it's still not working right, but it's a little bit better. We know there has to be something else besides um, the magnetic breaking and the gravitational um, radiation that's, that's happening. So you can see from this that there's a lot of systems right here, short orb orbital period. That's because for short orbital periods, the accretion rate is much less, and so you can see the white dwarf better. So if you're going to measure the white dwarf, you want to see it better, right? And, and the longer period ones are swamped with the, the accretion disk light. So we can't, it's really hard to get a measurement of the white dwarf temperature. So what we do for these are the ones above the period gap. So fortunately, nature turns off the accretion in those systems for whatever reason. We don't really have a good reason. Some thinks it's star spots on the secondary. Something is happening on the secondary that turns off the mass accretion. And then we can see the component stars. But you don't know when that's going to happen. So as soon as someone alerts, like the AVSO, that something has gone into a low state at these long periods, uh, we can get a spectrograph on it and see the stars and get a measurement. And then we're trying to do this now. So we're trying to get more measurements in this regime of longer periods because it's still not matching well at all here. We really don't understand what's going on. So we've now got, we've tried for five years, we finally got it. <laughs> it's a, a treasury program that's getting more data in the problem areas of this turnoff here, period bouncers and the uh, long period systems. So we hope in the next few years, this, it's going to be spread out over three years um, because the way ST, SCI wants us to do the program. Um, but we will get more data to fill in those gaps and hopefully say, have a bit more to say about uh, what's happening in evolution. Okay, so um, the other thing you can get from uh, HST is um, you can do the, take the data in time tag mode. And it lets you find a lot of short-term variability that's happening in the UV on the white dwarf. And among that kind of variability is the uh, pulsating white dwarfs. Uh, so pulsating white dwarfs give you a chance to do astroseismology because you're looking at the interior structure of the star. And so we can look, uh, look in the UV, and the UV pulse amplitude, you can't get a lot of UD data with HST because you get 40-minute swaths at a time. Um, but uh, the amplitudes are 6 to 10 times larger than the optical. And again, the white, you see more of the white dwarf in the UV than the optical. Um, so it's easier to work in the UV. Accreting pulsating white dwarfs give you a chance to do a comparison with single stars and look at the effects of accretion onto the white dwarf interior. So they're rotating faster, 200 seconds versus typically hours to days. They're hotter because of the accretion. The instability strip for pulsating white dwarfs is 11 to 16,000 versus 11 to 12,000 for single DAs. Their mixed composition, single DAs are pure hydrogen. Uh, these are one-tenth solar, uh, so there's uh, the and the fit to the instability strip by Theris is done with the addition of helium uh, as well as, as hydrogen because of that transfer from the secondary. They're more massive, as I said, and the best thing is they have these disk instabilities which dump a huge amount of material onto the white dwarf, heat it up by tens of thousands of degrees, shoves the star out of the instability strip, and then you can watch it cool back. But the cooling back only takes a few years, months to years, at least 15 years is what we're finding, but it's much faster than millions of years that you have to wait for evolutionary cooling. So this is the opportunity that we have. There's only 18 of these um, that have been um, discovered so far, and we have the temperatures of the white dwarf from HST. The orbital periods, you'll notice, are all very short. Uh, 70, 80 minutes, because that's where the mass transfer is less. You could see the white dwarf. Um, and the pulse periods are anywhere from four minutes to nine, about 20 minutes. Okay, so the one that we followed the most over the last 15 years is DW Lieb, the prototype, the brightest one. Um, so in quiescence, we got an HST spectrum um, that's in the red. Its temperature of the white dwarf is close to 15,000. And then three years after its outburst in 2007, and I forgot to say, well, there's, it's had two known outbursts, one, 1983 and 2007. When you have a very low mass transfer rate to the, to the white dwarf, 
takes a long time to build up to a disk instability. So, so they only go off every 20 or 30 years. So you have to be ready. <laughs> you don't know when it's going to go off. It's not periodic. So whenever one of these things goes off, then we try to you know, get it with HST and look at you know, the, the heating and the cooling that's going on. Um, so that's what we've, we've been trying to do for a couple of systems. Uh, so that we got the quiescence, um, and then we got in 2010, three years after the 2000 outburst, um, it's the black. It was already cooled down to 18,000. And then we kept on going. The next year, it went down to uh, 17,000. Uh, sorry, uh, where am I here? Um, I think I put the wrong temperature here. Uh, went down, it cooled down uh, to 17,000. It should be 16,000 here. The, that's the green. And then, unfortunately, we thought, well, the next three years, 13, 15, and 17, it's going to just keep on going back down to its quiescent level. But it did not. The blue and the light, the dark blue, the light blue, and the magenta there, six, eight, and 10 years after, it just stuck at this in-between level between the 16 and the 18. That's what should be the 17,000. OK, so this means that the white dwarf is not undergoing monotonic cooling after it's heated from the surface. And it's taking a long time. So the other way we can look at this is through the pulsation aspect, because that tells us what's happening in the interior structure. So at quiescence, for six to 10 years prior to its 2007 outburst, um, since the time of its discovery by Lisa Van Zyl and Brian Werner back in 2000, uh, paper in 2004, so you can see it went from you know, the same kind of pulse spectrum. This is the discrete the Fourier transform from 97 to 2001, has the sh same basic structure to that pulse period. We got some uh, UV STIS data, and this is the window function, so it looks a little weird because the HST has these 40-minute things that we can observe in. Um, but it's exactly the same periods, and the amplitudes are, are basically 10 times larger than, in, than the optical. So it seemed very like a normal white dwarf pulsator. After the outburst, one year after outburst, couldn't get the HST data until three years after, so one year after, it was still quite a bit hotter. Uh, but this strange 19-minute period showed up, totally different than it's. Um, the idea is, when it's heated, it cools back down, period should be shorter. So we expected the periods that were present at quiescence to come out at shorter periods when it was hotter, and then gradually get longer and longer and get back to, their, to their, those three periods that I showed you. But here's this strange mode that came on in 19 minutes, seen by many groups. Um, and there's also a four-hour period that was noted um, at, uh, during the quiescence that uh, appeared in the Galax UV data that we got, but um, does not appear um, all the time. It comes and goes. And the best data set that we had was in um, 2017 where we had HST data along with uh, K2 satellite pointing at it. So we had a long stretch, 40 days of optical data, uh, and then these pieces of HST data in between. So we were able to catch, um, so the, the red is the K2 data, which shows that 19 minute period, very, very obvious. These are not subtle effects, it's very obvious, you can see with your eye. The four-hour period is coming in in that slow hump. And then the HSD data is in black. And the HSD is simultaneous with this stretch. And it shows an increased amplitude of the four-hour hump and a short period of 275 seconds that only appears during the, the four-hour period. So we've got these three modes, 19 minutes, um, four hours, and 278 seconds that all appear to be tied together and really don't make much sense in terms of what should be happening to the heating structure. We continued our optical monitoring, and the 19-minute period is still there. We are now at the point where the pre-outburst pre data was taken by Lisa Van Zyl uh, with a very steady five years of um, normal quiescent periods, and we're not there. So that means the internal structure. So that means the cooling has not happened in 15 years, back to quiescence, and the internal structure of the white dwarf has not returned. So this gives us some time scale of the response of the white dwarf to 
accretion heating. Okay, I want to get into what, what we can gain from a lot of the other activity that, that's showing up. ZTF has been wonderful. It's been great to work with Tony and Jan on this data, many of the other people, Ashish, uh, that are here that are working on ZTF. And the great thing I think about, oh, ZTF has two great things. One is that it's really scaled to optical follow-up on reasonable size telescopes that we have existing now. And the other um, is that it, it did a lot in the galactic plane where most of the CVs exist and previous surveys have basically ignored uh, because it's too hard to work in the plane. So these are just some examples of light curves that um, CVs, so you can pick out a CV from the light curve. Um, they have lots of outbursts. This would be a typical disk system. This would be uh, a system that has what are called echo outbursts. So it has a big outburst and then the disk is constantly responding. It hasn't totally returned to its quiescence, so it has like mini outbursts. They have some different shapes. And the short period systems, the ones that are usually under two hours, have this very large amplitude. This is like five magnitudes and has this particular plateau to it, so the disk stays bright for a longer period of time before it drops off. So it's relatively easy to pick out a dwarf nova. That's why so many of those are known from the surveys. Uh, but we're, what you really need to classify a system is the follow-up optical spectra. So these are some of the spectra of ZTF sources. And what I particularly like to look at is the presence of helium-24686. So this major line here that you're seeing is H beta. And if you see that, that's usually an indication that there's a magnetic uh, field in there. And then we can follow up on some of the magnetic objects. So the one other, other interesting uh, thing that I was just talking with Jan today about is the, he has been finding these LARPs um, in the ZTF data. We originally saw them in Sloan because the quasar people thought they were quasars and couldn't match the line, so they sent, us, sent them over to us. Uh, the optical group, uh, and we identify them as cyclotron features. Um, these, this is what a, a low accretion rate system on a cold white dwarf uh, creates these cyclotron harmonics. Uh, and you can, the, the spread of the harmonics gives you the magnetic field. So this is a white dwarf temperature of 5,000 to 8,000, uh, magnetic field of about 60 megagauss, and a very low M dot. So this is a wind accretor. Uh, like in that first picture I showed you, and there's another one here. So Jan is finding about 10 of these in ZTF. There's probably many more. And the thing is, of the, the nearby survey that Anna Pala do, did with the, the Gaia CVs that are, that are known distances, 30 to 40 percent of those were magnetic CVs. And as I showed you, we know 4,000 uh, disc CVs, but only have 100 magnetic CVs. So we're way far short. There should be many more magnetic CVs out there. They're just harder to find. Um, and so you have to take more care in trying to locate them. And this tells you, you know, shows you what the problem is here. So we have those cyclotron humps, but you have to have photometry with the filters set on those humps in order to pick them up. So Gary Schmidt did this diagram for Sloan filters, which are the ones that many people use for surveys now, where things would lie on this diagram of G minus R and U minus G, with this is the main sequence and the white dwarfs, um, where the squares are the known LARPs, and this is where with known magnetic fields. So he did this map out. If you wanted to find objects of a certain magnetic field, you would look for this color because that's where the cyclotron humps would appear in a Sloan filter that would allow you to detect them. Okay, so it's, it's really a selection effect. Um, and Jan has found a way to look at just well, the light curve shapes to tell you what, what these things would be. Okay, so I got to get to the Kepler K2 and test data here. Um, the advantage of this is you get these uh, in Kepler, what, you had a couple years, and in K2 you've got 40 to 70 days of data. You get this uninterrupted coverage which was wonderful. You can look at time scales as short as 30 seconds to a minute or so uh, for that length of time, and it just shows you a lot of stuff that we couldn't see before. Um, okay, so one of the things we can really look at what we know about dwarf nova outbursts. So the theory of dwarf nova outbursts is the disk, when the matter dumps into the disk, 
it can start um, the increased accretion from the outside of the disk or from the inside of the disk. And the shape of the outburst tells you um, where the outburst is starting. So a symmetric uh, outburst here, and this is a, you know, these things are usually a couple magnitudes. Um, they start, this would be a low M dot system. It starts from the inside out. Uh, if it comes more asymmetric, so it's steeper on the rise and comes down slower, then it's a higher uh, M dot. And then this is higher yet, and then you get these weird things like this, where the disk somehow stops. You know, it's starting to cool, but then it reaches some radius and starts another outburst, another increased accretion episode. So we gained a lot, and this is, gave a lot of um, fodder for theorists to, for, to explain for disks. One of the things I found interesting, this is another one with these halt in the middle. This is an object that uh, Colin, um, so I've, I've done a lot of this work, uh, Colin and, and uh, Peter Garnovich, uh, Notre Dame, have done a lot of the work with the, with the Kepler and K2 data analysis. Um, so this is one where you have this, this n kind of a normal large amplitude dwarf nova outburst. But, but I thought it's very interesting to see this, what the activity levels before compared to out afterwards. And I'll show you some other examples of some recent kind of activity that we've seen in other kinds of systems. This is much, these are basically a magnitude or so, uh, a little less than a magnitude. But so it's a higher level before the major outburst, a lower level afterwards, but also look at the activity level between these little bursts that are happening here. This is not periodic, but it looks pretty regular. There's something happening here. It's very quiet afterwards. So it gives you some clue as to what's happening in the structure of the accretion, um, the matter that's accreting onto the white dwarf in between. So it seems it's building up and building up into an outburst, and then it, it levels. But we don't know what is causing these little mini things. And, and this is the first time we've actually seen some of this kind of structure happening outside of an outburst. If you look at nova likes, these are systems that are, are longer period. Their mass accretion rate, mass transfer rate is so high that the disk never really has a chance to dissipate and, and form a, you know, a dwarf nova outburst. So it's always in like a high accretion state, except they sometimes mysteriously turn off their accretion for reasons I said we, we really don't, do not understand. So this is the AVSO light curve for about 50 years, um, showing you the activity level of the system that has a period of 3.2 hours above the period gap. And you can see the Kepler data took place in that little red section there. So the second thing in the middle here is the Kepler data during that red piece of um, time. And you can see it goes into this low state. Of eight, and it's not subtle. It goes from 12th to 18th magnitude. It's a huge change. Um, and this is when, we, if the, you know, the disk clears out, we can actually see the stars. But what Simone found in looking at in more detail, just during this time, the third panel down is, is the time from t day 24 uh, to 26, right in that lowest part. He saw this activity almost like what I just showed you for the uh, dwarf nova. But this is a nova-like. It has 30-minute bursts about every two hours. They're not regular, They're approximately on that time scale. Um, and this was the first indication that there is something going on and they might be magnetic. So he came up with this idea of what's called magnetic gating. And so if you have um, a magnetic field that's at a critical point that uh, creates a barrier for the uh, accretion trying to come, come onto the white dwarf, uh, and that happens to be right at the, co -rot or the rotation period in the disk that matches the white dwarf spin, then it, it, well, it can't, uh, can't come on, it can't accrete. But as the, as the stuff builds up from the disk, it pushes against that barrier and, until it gets past the, the core rotation radius. And then there's this like dumping 
um, and creates this luminosity, accretion luminosity, that's shown in the upper scheme there. And then as that matter dumps, then the disk recedes back uh, and stops until it builds up again. So you have to have the situation so the disk is right, the magnetic field is right, so the disk is right at that level. So it's not going to happen in most systems, but it will happen in some. And so for this system, MV Lyra, we have um, fused data. So we have a good model fit to the white dwarf. Uh, and we can fit the, um, the absorption lines to get a spin of the white dwarf, the rotation rate. So we've got the spin and the temperature and the luminosity from Gaia. And so uh, Simone put this diagram together of, for the critical rate and the period of the spin of, of the white dwarf uh, and the radius of the disk. You have this region, and that can give you the magnetic field. So the magnetic field in this case is between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the fifth Gauss. Now we have no way of measuring a field like that directly. We can't do Zeeman, can't do cyclotron. Um, but it's an indication, it's always been suspected that these systems do have magnetic white dwarfs in the Kilgauss regime. And this is like a proof that um, this, is a, this happens. And we've also, Cohen found another nova like TW Pick uh, during a, a test low state that has similar properties. So it's, at least there's two now, and there's, there's more that are comparable. Um, so this is the same kind of behavior. We're talking about a magnitude or so of increases. Um, this one has 12 bursts. Um, this is V1025 sen, uh, period of 85 minutes. The spin period is an IP. So the inner disk, we know it's magnetic because we see the white dwarf spin at a different time scale than the orbital period. Um, it's 12 bursts that last less than six hours and repeat every day or so, one to four days. Um, and this one we know, because it's an IP, all IPs are thought to have magnetic fields of 1 to 10 megagauss. So it ties together. Okay. And now we have these other systems that have been found um, by Simone. A TV coal that has these uh, bursts that are 32 minutes. And this top one is just the long time scale from uh, tests, but um, the bottom one is a blow up on a greater time scale of structure that's seen in these bursts. And these things have larger energies. These are um, 10 to the 38th Earths per second, whereas the magnetic gating is 10 to the 34th. We were able to catch one of these bursts during long ago, uh, 1982, an IUE run. And uh, a graduate student was uh, taking atometry at the same time, so we have optical magnitudes. We saw this happen between one exposure and the next. We thought we'd moved to the wrong object. But you can see the change from the top, from the first spectrum, that this is uh, data in the UV, 1100 to um, 3100. And the, the spectrum totally changed. The high excitation lines of carbon-4, helium-2 came up. So we knew it was a very fast, very highly energetic event. It all fits um, with these things being, um, there's two more of these in tests that are seen. And then there are, um, then there are times when they, we see the accretion totally turn off. Uh, this is a recent case that um, a student working with uh, Peter has, has found. Uh, that low state at the top, uh, Dio Dr Draconis is an IP. Um, the, the expansion here is of the that really lowest part there, dear 1890. And here's an a even blow up that's uh, two hours here, two days here. Um, you can see that it's a very regular ellipsoidal variation that matches the period. So basically, there is no disk left in this IP, and it's turned off. Um, it's turned off in a matter of very short time scale. So this gives us a time scale also for how fast the disk can change and the mass transfer turn off and turn on in these kinds of systems. So we have LST coming on. And the problem is the cadence is not going to be certainly not as good as K2 or TESS. Uh, we'll have a long string of 10, 10 years, hopefully. Um, but we need a cadence that's good enough to 
to give us a recognizable light curve. We need the colors to be able to um, put these on a color magnitude diagram to help us de determine what kind of object it is. We're going to have to use machine learning because we're not going to have time to go through these one by one, which you know Jan has been doing for, for the ZTF data and others have been doing as well. Uh, we're going to have to be able to do it. We're going to get millions of sources. We're going to have to be able to deal with them. And the problem is LSST is going to be uh, very faint. We're not going to be able to reach 27th magnitude, so that's not going to help us too much. We need, and most of all, we need the coordination so that people doing the follow-up aren't looking at the same sources at the same time. So we need a way to extract what is important and to send it out so that a group can actually do the follow-up um, to get out so we can solve some of these problems. So this is just a summary of what I've said here. We know there's dwarf nova outbursts, so we have a thumbs up. We have a pretty good idea of out normal outbursts. But all that other activity, pre and post outbursts, even in a, in a dwarf nova system, we have no clue what, what's causing that. Um, the activity of nova loads, why do they shut off? Why does the stream completely stop? And do they really, does it just completely go away as it appears to do in um, why we draw? So we don't know, and there's all that burst activity um, on timescales of hours and days, so we don't really know the ultimate cause of that. And then the angular momentum losses, we know we have a rough idea of what's there, but this empirical uh, loss due to mass transfer still needs a lot more work as to what's actually the cause of that and how does it actually work, translate over into the evolution. Magnetic fields are always a, a problem. You know, we think they're formed from the white dwarf and the common envelope, et cetera. Sometimes there's a lot of mergers that can take place. Uh, but it's really hard to get a, a handle on the strengths of the field, so we have to use these indirect methods to try to figure out what the fields actually are and how they, they interact with uh, all the accretion that's going off. And then the last thing, you know, that goes along with the activity of the nova likes, we don't know um, why they're turning off. Um, it has to do something with the secondary star. So there's a lot of aspects of CV work that uh, still need a lot of work. Maybe I'll keep, keep us all busy for another 50 years, I don't know. Okay, I'll start there. I'll stop there. All right, we have time for some questions. Could you say something about the properties of radio emission? Oh, radio emission, that's been an interesting thing. Um, yeah, so it turns out the magnetic systems are showing radio. You mean it's similar in what way? Well, I mean, if you say that you know, the magnetic field is disrupted, there's only heavy accretion or something like that. Um, track that also on the radio. I think right now it's all been just what, which objects are detected in, in radio, and it's really just the ones that have magnetic fields. I don't know if they've been able to follow them. It's, it's Paul Barrett and uh, Paul Mason that have been doing this work. Uh, with the VLA. They're continuing, and I think Paul's ready to, he's supposed to be coming out with some, some uh, paper, uh, DLT angular rights, but I don't think he's really done monitoring. It's really just, it takes a while to get enough just a detection. And whether he's matched that to the activity states of the highs and lows. Uh, no, it took the VLA. I mean, I think there were, eight, there's been one or two exceptions that they found uh, radio emission prior to the VLA, but it was the VLA upgrade that allowed them to, to, to actually do a survey of, of a lot of them now. Yeah, so we can watch for that paper to come out. Oh, MV layer. Yeah. So, can we explain why we should have a 10 to the 4 gauss field there? Because most of the magnetic ones are much stronger than that. And I think that's actually getting into this magnetic desert where we don't see many magnetic white dwarfs. Right. Below. Well, it's between 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 5th. So, this is a pretty big error bar. But, yeah. I mean, this, 
it's always been suspected that th those things have magnetic fields because they're in the same regime where the IPs normally sit as well. So the question, um, in terms of orbital period. And so are they really connected to those and, and why are some, it could just be the, the state of the accretion, but why the magnetic field is not strong enough. I mean, because they're higher accretors, I think, generally. Um, so they may be coming into this, you know, their lifetime is at a different place as well, being born in a different slot. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, you can tell me more about how magnetic fields form than, yeah, in, in terms of the evolutionary structure of, of why some would be lower and some would be higher. I had another question. You know, you have you were president of AAABSO. Yeah. So you have this huge team of amateurs who are following some of these things for 50 years. Wouldn't maybe triggers from them be more effective than LSST for for getting rapid spectral follow up of some of these? Yeah. Things? Well, they, they tend to have 30 inch telescopes at most, so. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, so they right. are. A lot of the amateurs now have spectrographs on their telescopes. And I have used them so much because it, t for us to observe with HST because of these, because of the activity, HST requires us to monitor these objects for two weeks prior <coughs> to the time. And we have to put a hold on the data so that we, they have to, we have to provide them with a ground-based measurement within 24 hours to eliminate the hold. Uh, and there's only been, I don't, Oh, how many hundreds? We probably observed a hundred. We've only had two cases where the object has been, you know, too bright. And it's not really too bright, but with it, we're being very safe that we've had to stop the observation. Then we don't get it back. Uh, but still, for, to, to monitor 40 objects, they say it's a lot of work. Can't do it on weekends because the staff is not working on JWST and so. You know, there's all these problems so, to try to get the data. And, and many of these cases, the outbursts are every 30 years. And so if they had one last year, why do we need to do all this, you know? But, but that's the requirements. So it, it's just hard. So the AAVSO people, they are the ones who provide us this two weeks of monitoring and the night before. They can't really do, for objects that are faint, I mean, they can go down to 18th maybe. Um, 19th if you really stack up, and they will stack 30 minutes at a time. <laughs> they are wonderful. Um, so they've, they've been a big asset, but they're not going to take the place of, you know, Kepler P2, Kess. Yeah. Sorry, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the IPs are generally hard X ray sources. So I'm just wondering, do you review them? Like, interesting ones from ARC? They do have regions of the sky where they they have the fairly high cadence. I mean, I know they're off now, but you know. Yeah, Tony is working with the. Where is Tony? Right there. Oh, sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's doing just that. So it's going to be excellent. Yeah, because they can go much deeper. Um, and identify many of those. So I'm hoping that Tony's going to come out with a huge set of magnetic CVs, all the, you know, the ones that we've been missing so far, just because it's so much more sensitive. Um, I can pinpoint the accuracy is better, right, in terms of the, you know, the, with the pointing. Well, we hope so, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any last questions? Okay.